Uh, in the beginning, you have to target the applications. And in the beginning, we did. Well, we're a computing platform company, and we have to go uh, go up the stack as far as we need to so that developers can use it. Mm -hmm. And so our company got very good at designing computer algorithms that for the very first time in the history of computing, the language of programming a computer is human. Uh, so you were working on this huge set of applications before the you know current rate wave of artificial intelligence. What was the original... Um, technical advantage of NVIDIA in, in artificial intelligence and when did you begin to realize that um, this was going to be an important use case for you guys? Uh, so we we had we had um, uh, expanded the the flexibility of our of our um, of our accelerators to to be more general purpose and we invented a, a new computing model uh, called CUDA and um, we're doing this podcast like at four o'clock or something like that in the afternoon. It was like at the lowest point of energy. Isn't that right? Yeah. So we wanted to we wanted to make our our um, our graphics processors more and more general. And the reason for that in the beginning was because some of the effects that we had to do related to general purpose image processing, post effects. You render an image and you do post post um, image effects. Um, other applications, of course. We wanted to bring the scene to life, and so we had to do physics processing. And you have to do physics, you have to do particle physics, fluid dynamics, so on and so forth. And so we, we expanded the aperture of our, of our accelerated computing platform to be more and more and more general purpose. The problem with general purposeness is that the more general purpose you are, the less um, acceleration you get in any particular domain. And so you have, you got to find that 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 line really, really carefully. And that's one of the gifts of our company to find that line between, on the one hand, every single generation bringing enormous amounts of acceleration well beyond what CPU could do um, to the application. And so if you become too general purpose, you're like just like a CPU. How can you accelerate a CPU with a CPU? And so you, so you have to find a way to walk that line. On the other hand, if you don't expand the aperture of the applications that you serve, the R&D dollars that you're able to generate wouldn't be enough to stay ahead of the CPU, which had the largest R&D budget of any chip on the planet. So if you think about this problem, it's actually really nearly impossible because you have a small application, let's call it, you know, a billion dollar market at the time. And, and out of that billion dollar market, you're investing $150, $150 million a year. Out of that $150 million a year, how do you keep up with a few hundred billion dollar industry. It's not even sensible. And so you have to find that niche very, very carefully where $150 million would accelerate this particular application abnormally and insanely. And then over time, you could expand your application space so that it goes from a billion dollars to $5 billion to $10 billion, so on and so forth, without falling off that cliff. That is the fine line that we, work, we walk and, and so we kept expanding the, the general purposeness and it led us to uh, molecular dynamic simulation, which is what this image seems to look like. And, and um, uh, seismic processing was another uh, industry. And uh, just slowly by surely, uh, we, we expanded our aperture. But one of the things that we did well was to make sure that, that irrespective of whether somebody used our platform for general purpose computing, accelerated computing, we always maintain the architecture compatibility. And the reason for that is because we wanted uh, a platform that would attract developers. If every single NVIDIA chip in the world was incompatible, then how would a developer be able to pick one up, even if they learned that, that CUDA was going to be incredible for them, how would they pick that up and say, I'm going to develop an application that's going to run on that? Which chip would they, would they have to go figure out? And, and nobody could figure that out. And so we said, if we're going to, if we believe in an architecture, and if we want this to be a new computing platform, then let's make sure that every one of our chips uh, perform exactly the same way, just like an x86, just like ARM, just like any computing platform. And so, for the first five, ten years, you know, we had very few customers for CUDA, but we made every chip CUDA compatible. And you can go back in history and look at looked at our gross margins. Um, it started out, it started out poor, and it got worse. You know, so yeah, because we were we were in a really competitive industry and and we were still trying to figure out how to do our job and build cost effective things. So, so you know, it, it was already challenging as it is. And then we layered on top of this 
this architecture that was called CUDA that had no applications that nobody paid for. Yeah. It's and kind so, of amazing because now when I talk to people in the AI world in terms of one of the reasons that they really love using NVIDIA GPUs is because of CUDA mm-hmm. and then because of the ability to scale interconnect. Yeah. And so you can really like highly parallelize these things as well, which you can't necessarily do with other approaches or architectures that are in the market today. Yeah, and so this this computing platform, it, it's uh, it, it's strange in the sense that it does it performs these miraculous things, um, and and uh, we carried it to to the world on the backs of GeForce, which is a gaming mm-hmm. card, mm-hmm. Uh, the, the first GPU that Jeff Hinton got for his lab. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Ela would tell you that that uh, Jeff came in and said, "Here's a couple of uh, uh, GPUs. Mm-hmm. It's called GeForce, and uh, you, you guys should try to use that for for um, yeah. uh, for uh, DNN." I got to to interrupt with a really funny story that happened recently. McDonald's in China. If you order a McFlurry, they ask you if you want a Nvidia keychain with it, and it only sells for twenty dollars. But the problem is, they only made that available to less than ten thousand customers. So their NVIDIA keychain is already sold out, and it's right now in the retail market and sells for hundreds of dollars. And Elon commented on this, and he said that he had no idea that this was happening, and added, in that case, I will definitely have some just for you to know. The first link in description. Click on it if you want to buy this NVIDIA keychain. I don't know if this is a collaboration, but NVIDIA in China has posted about this, and also McDonald's in China posted about it. But anyways, in the next couple of years, this product might even sell for thousands of dollars. We don't get that many chances to buy rare collectibles like this. Anyways, find the link at the description and hurry, because we have just 100 pieces left. And so it was a gaming card. That what, what applications did you have in mind? Because to your point, you started with gaming, or at least you were very popular with gaming starting in the 90s when you started the company. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I started hearing about NVIDIA GPUs more and more, both in the context of cryptocurrencies and sort of mining, and then in the context of AI. And it seemed like those were the two markets where a bunch of people were organically just adopting you. Was it? Were you marketing to those communities? Was it just people started realizing that that's they the needed be- linear that's algebra? The, and, that's the beauty know? of a computing platform, yeah. right? Uh, in the beginning, you have to target the applications, and in the beginning, we did. Uh, one of the first applications was NAMD, mm-hmm. uh, seismic processing. Um, uh, it was uh, both of them. Both of them are are, are uh, one of those kind of particle physics. The other one is uh, image processing, if you will, so, and so inverse physics, if you will. Mm-hmm. And and so uh, one particular domain, uh, you know, we just we just went out to hire it to to um, uh, research. We went to scientific computing. Um, centers and, and we said, what kind of pl- problems are just beyond your reach? Mm. And uh, um, the list of applications are include yeah. quantum chemistry and quantum physics and you know so on and so forth. What was the moment when you said, "Wow, this AI thing is really important for us"? Uh, it happened. It happened uh, uh, around 2012, I guess, and it was because uh, simultaneously Andrew Ang uh, reached out to Bill Daly, our our chief scientist. Um, to uh, work on a way to get the neural network model that they were working on mm-hmm. uh, onto GPU so that they could, instead of using uh, thousands of uh, CPU servers, mm-hmm. they could use a few GPUs uh, to uh, to do training. So that was one. Simultaneously, almost uh, simultaneously, uh, Jeff Hinton reached out to us and we started hearing about that. And uh, same thing was happening with Jan LeCun in his lab. And, mm-hmm. and so simultaneously in several different labs, we're starting to feel that there's this this uh, this neural network mm-hmm. you know, emergence that that is and and that attracted our attention. Yeah, I guess 2012 was also the year when AlexNet came out, so it yeah, felt right. like that was a year of transition for deep learning in general in terms of really that was the moment in time at least that I remember thinking, wow, this this really exciting wave of AI coming. Yeah, and then I feel like for 10 years nothing really happened for startups, but a lot of incumbents started adopting this technology. Yeah, yeah, we started feeling yeah. it. We started hearing about it before that, and then ImageNet kind of it mm. was it was the big bang, if you will, got all of our attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you talk about uh, sort of the um, early AI labs as pulling this from NVIDIA using gaming cards because mm-hmm. you were solving a problem nobody else could solve mm-hmm. um, and like efficiency and scale. Mm. Um, is there a point at which NVIDIA begins to like in, invest in an application because they think it's like a growing application or is it more like it's a platform and the market will take it from us? No, um, uh, in every single case when, when an application um, finds use, uh, we ask ourselves, how can we make it even better? Mm-hmm. And this time with with deep learning, um, uh, the the good insight that we made 
uh, and it, it, it was, you know, piecing together uh, observations in, in a lot of different ways, but, but realizing that this isn't just going to be a new algorithm for computer vision, which is really most of the applications in the beginning, but which was going to be very helpful. I mean, just, just if it was just computer vision, we could have used it for all kinds of interesting applications like self-driving cars and robotics, and, and we did. Uh, but we observed that this might be a new way of writing software altogether and asking ourselves what's the implication to chip design, system design, interconnect, the algorithm, the system software, uh, to, to really reason about not just why is this exciting, why was it so effective, which was, impl- it, it was that alone was plenty miraculous. Mm-hmm. That ImageNet uh, without without uh, uh, specifically any human engineered algorithm would would reach the level of effectiveness you know compared to 30 years of computer vision al- algorithms uh, overnight you know and it wasn't it wasn't by a small amount and so the first question of course is why is it so effective and was this going to be scalable and if it was going to be scalable what's the implication to the rest of computer science what what problems can't this universal, function approximator, if you will, that can solve problems of dimensionality extraordinarily high. And yet you could um, uh, learn the function using enough data, which at the time we were starting to believe we can get plenty of, and to to uh, systematically train this model into existence because, you know, it's, it's uh, you train them one layer at a time. Can you talk a little bit more about, I've, I've heard you be very articulate in terms of how you view this as a broader platform shift, just even in terms of like how pages are served versus, you know, generated or other aspects of that. Could you talk a little bit more about, you know, what's really happening right now more broadly in computer science with the shift to AI? Yeah, so you fast forward now a decade. The first the first five years was was about reasoning the impact to computer science altogether. Um, the At the same time, we're developing uh, new models of, of all kinds, right? And so CNNs to ResNets to RNNs to LSTMs to, you know, all kinds of new models and, and scaling them larger and larger, making great strides in perception models particularly. And of course, the uh, the Transformer was a big deal. BERT was a big deal. Um, all, all of you know that story well. And um, did you guys see like a like a step change in, in volume growth, right, uh, with Transformers and, and BERT and such? Um, because it feels like having a architecture and a me- like an attention mechanism that allowed for scaling of these models really was also a kickstart in the industry. Well, the the ability for you to learn um, patterns and relationships from spatial as well as sequential data uh, must be an architecture that's very effective, right? And so, so I think on its on its first principles, you you can kind of think transformer is going to make it's going to be a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. Not only that, you could train it in parallel and you can really scale this model up. And so that's very, very exciting. Um, uh, And so I I think that that when Transformers first came out, uh, we realized that that there's a model now that overcame the limitations of RNNs and LSTMs and and, um, uh, we can now learn sequential data in in a very large way. So that was very exciting. Uh, BERT was very exciting. Um, uh, we trained some of the early language models ourselves, and, and we saw very good results. Uh, but it, it wasn't until it wasn't until um, uh, uh, the combination of uh, reinforcement learning, human feedback, uh, wasn't, and, and of course some of the breakthrough work that was done with retrieval models, um, uh, dialogue managers that, that does the guard railing. Um, it wasn't until some of all of those kind of pieces started to come together that, of course, that we all enjoy ChatGPT and. And Eli, the, the point that you're trying to make is, is um, uh, the observation that computer programming has now uh, been completely disrupted. That for the very first time in the history of computing, the language of programming a computer is human. I got to, to interrupt with a really funny story that happened recently. McDonald's in China. If you order a McFlurry, they ask you if you want a NVIDIA keychain with it, and it only sells for $20. But the problem is, they only made that available to less than 10,000 customers. So their NVIDIA keychain is already sold out, and it's right now in the retail market and sells for hundreds of dollars. And Elon commented on this, and he said that he had no idea that this was happening, and added 
in that case, I will definitely have some just for you to know. The first link in description. Click on it if you want to buy this NVIDIA keychain. I don't know if this is a collaboration, but NVIDIA in China has posted about this, and also McDonald's in China posted about it. But anyways, in the next couple of years, this product might even sell for thousands of dollars. We don't get that many chances to buy rare collectibles like this. Anyways, find the link at the description and hurry, because we have just 100 pieces left. Mm -hmm. You know, any human language, and and uh, it doesn't even have to be grammatically correct. And, and <laughs> it's, it's fairly incredible that that um, anyone can program a computer now. Mm -hmm. And so that's a that's a that's a big deal. Uh, the fact that you program it differently, it writes different applications. Um, what is the reach of this new computing uh, mm -hmm. computing model? Uh, apparently quite quite large and it's, it's the reason why chat gpt is the fastest growing application in history mm -hmm. we had um alex gravely who was the chief architect for copilot uh -huh. on the show as well and uh his, his favorite like obviously it's you know very powerful to have sort of um uh sequential code prediction but his favorite use cases of copilot have been like people telling him that they don't code but now they do uh, yeah right which is which i think is very democratizing as you said it's quite amazing that you yeah. could give uh um chat gpt a, a a problem to solve and it reasons through it step by step um, but yet it, it arrives at the wrong answer on the one hand on the other hand you could tell it to write a program to solve the same problem and it writes a program that solves the problem perfectly and so the the fact that that there's an application that on the one hand reasons and tries to solve a problem and does a fairly good job at it it's almost there um, on, on the other hand it can write a program altogether to solve that same problem you know, it's it's uh, you got to really wrap your head around the implication of this. Um, so, do you view it as uh, like know. the future world is some form of machine sentience? Well, first of all, I don't even know what that word means so, <laughs> uh, in, yeah. a, in a technical way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm fairly sure that I'm sentient. Less so today, but uh, I, I don't, I don't know. But do I do I believe that uh, we now have a, a, a software? that can reason through a problem uh, for many, many types of problems, reason through a problem and solve and provide a solution uh, or a program to systematically provide a solution on an ongoing basis, the answer is yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then as you look forward to that world, how do you think about um, where you want to take NVIDIA's lines of business, but also you mentioned in the past that NVIDIA has done things like train models and you've done some really interesting things there. Is that going to be an increasing part of what you do in the future or are you mainly focused on the chip side or how do you think about that mix of helping to push forward some research as well as, you know, being the underlying platform for the industry? Well, we're a computing platform company and we have to go, uh, go up the stack as far as we need to so that developers can use it. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what is a developer? And in the beginning, of course, a developer is somebody who uh, uh, controls their own operating system. Mm -hmm. And and so in those days, we might only have to go as far up as device drivers or the layer slightly underneath that somehow um, that that um, uh, to to enable developers. But but for scientific computing and, and all these different domains, the developer is actually using maybe a solver, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they need the algorithms. Uh, of that domain to be uh, somehow uh, expressed in a way that could be accelerated, which is the reason why when we moved into these multi-domain physics problems, uh, we realized that we have to develop the algorithms themselves. Mm -hmm. Because the algorithms of, of, of um, uh, solving a problem relates to the computer architecture that's underneath. Mm -hmm. And if the architecture is CPUs connected through MPI and you know Ethernet or whatever it is, um, that algorithm is surely very different than thousands of processors that's connected by a fabric inside one GPU and thousands of GPUs inside a data center. So obviously the, the algorithm has to be reframed and refactored. And so our company got very good at designing computer algorithms. It could be for particle physics or fluid dynamics or, and then of course one day it was related to deep learning and neural networks. Mm -hmm. And QDNN is essentially a domain-specific language for accelerated deep learning. Mm -hmm. And so we've done that for deep neural nets. We've done that for um, computer graphics with ray tracing. That's called RTX. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all of these different, different domain libraries um, really is about understanding the domain of science 
and then redesigning algorithms that make them go incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. um, now, in the future, what's a developer? Well, I think in, a, in the future, a developer is likely uh, going to be somebody who engages large language models or foundation models. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody could use uh, ChatGPT or OpenAI's model, I really encourage that. And the reason for that is because they do such an incredible job. If somebody could use it through Microsoft, I really encourage that. If somebody could could uh, use it through Google, I would really encourage that. Mm -hmm. But if somebody um, needs to build a proprietary model for a domain, maybe maybe create a new foundation model, uh, and let's say the domain was proteins, or mm -hmm. let's say the domain was chemicals, or um, let's say the domain was uh, climate science, multi-physics. Mm -hmm. that, that foundation model is, is pretty niche -y. And it's not it's not a small market, obviously, because the, the the field of drug discovery is large, the field of climate science is large, climate tech is large. However, um, it's not likely to be horizontally useful for every human. And so we might decide to go do something like a foundation model for uh, 3D graphics, uh, virtual worlds, mm -hmm. because they're super important to us. We might decide to build a foundation model for robotics because it's at an intersection of the things that we do very well. To, to interrupt with a really funny story that happened recently, McDonald's in China. If you order a McFlurry, they ask you if you want a NVIDIA keychain with it, and it only sells for $20. But the problem is, they only made that available to less than 10,000 customers. So their NVIDIA keychain is already sold out, and it's right now in the retail market and sells for hundreds of dollars. And Elon commented on this, and he said that he had no idea that this was happening, and added... In that case, I will definitely have some just for you to know. The first link in description. Click on it if you want to buy this NVIDIA keychain. I don't know if this is a collaboration, but NVIDIA in China has posted about this, and also McDonald's in China posted about it. But anyways, in the next couple of years, this product might even sell for thousands of dollars. We don't get that many chances to buy rare collectibles like this. Anyways, find the link at the description and hurry, because we have just 100 pieces left.